Um, but we are actually going to finish this morning our series on these American idols that we've been talking about. And we're going to end with the spirit of Molech. And uh, my goal this morning is to open your eyes to the spiritual battle that we are in every single day. To reveal, uh, my goal is to reveal one of the ways that this enemy battles for your mind and for your life and to give you practical steps of how to break free of the enemy's grasp. Do you guys want to be free? Then you got to know who you're fighting. Church, do you guys want victory in your life? All right, then, then lend ear because, and listen to how God is going to help you overcome. So now in this series, we've been singling out these idols uh, uh, in America that have taken our country captive. We talked about mammon, um, which is this, this idea, the spirit of greed that's overtaken our country. We've talked about Baal, this spirit of pride, this self-worth, this self-sufficiency. We've talked about Asherah last week, this spirit of, of sexual addiction, etc. Today we're going to look at Molech, the spirit that targets the sanctity of life. Uh, now this idol, uh, as we've said throughout the series, is uh, an idol is anyone or anything that takes the place of God in your life. That's an idol. Simply said, an idol, anything or anyone that takes the place of God in your life. So effectively, an idol can be anything other than God, depending on how you elevate it. Anything that has taken priority over God in your life is an idol. And I want you to understand, though, that these idols are part of a spiritual battle for your mind. Satan is battling for your mind. And ultimately, Satan is battling for your allegiance. Human beings are not the root cause of your trials. Satan is doing all he can, sometimes through humans, to bring about his anarchy and his purposes. The Bible says this in Ephesians 6. It says, For we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. We are not fighting each other. Church, say this. Say, we are not fighting each other. We are not fighting each other. Our battle isn't against flesh and blood. Our battle is against Satan and the unseen world by eye. If we're going to fight these spiritual battles and temptations that want to rob our purity and our joy in our lives, then we have to be able to identify the enemy, right? We got to know who the enemy is. Have you ever went into battle with an enemy that you have no idea who he is? Some of us, right? You don't know how to defend yourself. You don't know what to do. You don't know how to act. Uh, 2006, 2007, I was part of the Army National Guard, and uh, I went overseas to Iraq. And while I was there, um, I did 55-plus combat missions. Um, I was an ASV driver. Our job was convoy security. We were on the roads uh, with all the bombs and everything that you hear about on the news. Um, our job was to secure these convoys, make sure that they got from point A to point B, uh, Ramadi, Fallujah, Baghdad, all the, you know, the Sunni Triangle, the places, uh, the, the infamous places. But half the time, we didn't know who we were fighting. We didn't know who the enemy was. Uh, let me tell you how hard it is to make proper decisions when you don't know who the enemy is. The second to last thing you want to do in a combat situation is overreact. You don't want to overreact. You don't want to get an innocent bystander or civilian killed. The very last thing you want to do is underreact. You don't want to get your battle buddy killed next to you. You don't want to get yourself killed because you failed to pull the trigger in a combat situation. But in Iraq, we saw, we saw civilians every single day. We saw civilians that looked just like this. Go back one. Yeah, tell me which one is a terrorist. Which one of these has a, has a bomb strapped underneath their man dress, and which one of these has an AK-47 behind the back? We're fighting a war in a country that we couldn't clearly identify the enemy. And, and this is part of the reason, without going all political, but this is all part of the reason why the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan have gone on as long as they have. We're not able to sufficiently identify the enemy, and they know this. They use it to their advantage. 
So one of our last missions in country, one of the, the very last things that we did, one of our convoy elements went out on a mission. They were just coming back. We were just finishing up. Um, we were days away from getting out of this country. And suddenly driving through one of these towns, uh, Fallujah, you may have heard of, um, a grenade exploded at the foot of one of our vehicles. Fortunately, uh, this grenade did minimal damage. Had the, the grenade reached its intended target, which was the gunner's hatch on the top of the Humvee, uh, would, have been a, a, would have been a bad day. But fortunately, it missed. And uh, you guys want to know what the enemy looked like that day? You want to know who threw that grenade? It was Iraqi children that threw that grenade that day. Kids just like this in Fallujah, we would throw books to. We would throw soccer balls. We would give candy to as we passed through. And I guess one day they decided to return fire. See, we are, we are fighting a war where we had no idea, no idea who, who the enemy was. Anyone could engage you at any time, even little children like, like we saw. But church, when it comes to our spiritual battles in life, right? We know who the enemy is, amen? We know that the enemy is not flesh and blood, but it's Satan, it's the evil rulers, it's the authorities. These idols that you fight in your life are often strongholds that the enemy has used in your life to trip you up. But what are these strongholds, right? Who are these evil rulers and authorities? And when we look through the Bible, we can see that our triune God has a structure and order to the heavenly, the heavenly realms, the heavenly places. There's Christ, we got seraphim, we got cherubim, we have archangels, there's authorities, there's rulers. God has set up this kingdom in a very ordered and structured way. But in the Bible also, we see that Satan has a counterfeit kingdom. Everything God does, Satan has a counterfeit for. Did you know that? Augustine, the great Augustine, called Satan the simiest day, the ape of God. He's an imitator. He's a counterfeit. Just as God is a trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Satan has a false trinity. The devil, the beast, the false prophet. Go ahead and bring that graphic up. Satan has a, a false church. He has his own church. And get ready for air quotes. I'm going to use these a lot. You can do it with me. They're a lot of fun. But Revelation 2.9 says that he has this synagogue of Satan. He has his own ministers, right? His own sacrificial system, much like God's. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10.20, Paul is addressing the Corinthian church. He's talking about pagan idol worship. He says that these sacrifices are not sacrifices offered uh, to just these idols, but they are sacrifices offered to demons, not God. He goes on to talk about Satan's version of, of communion or the demon's cup or the table of demons, all counterfeits of God's kingdom. Satan proclaims his own gospel message, and you better believe Satan is a talented preacher. He has his own throne, much in the way God does. He has worshipers, he has false teachers, false prophets, apostles, false brethren that infiltrate the church. You can see then how Augustine coined him the ape or the imitator of God. But see, Satan doesn't like to act alone, guys. Satan doesn't like to do it alone. Unlike God, Satan is not everywhere at one time. He's not all-knowing and all-powerful. He is confined to one place at one given time. And Satan, much in the way of God, has set up rulers and authorities and, and, and these, these powers so what you're fighting for is not flesh and blood, but you are fighting the father of lies and his counterfeit kingdom. Let me move on by saying this. Only one of those kingdoms is going to stand all throughout eternity. Only the one true God's true kingdom will enter this eternal realm. And as for Satan and his trinity and his kingdom, well, the Bible gives us the answer in Revelation 20. Then the devil who had, been, had deceived them, was thrown into the fiery lake of burning sulfur, joining the beast and the false prophet. There they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Amen. Now, one of the ways Satan will seduce you uh, is through idols or strongholds in your life. 
He binds us with things like greed, like lust, like pride. This is how he binds us. These produce fruits. And outwardly, we see things like stealing, greed, adultery, uh, self-sufficiency. These are the sins that we see on the outside. Now, another place that Satan often targets is the sanctity of life itself. See, if Satan can convince the world that we are just evolved animals or that human life has little or no importance, he can destroy us. He can actually get us to destroy ourselves. Now, a pastor by the name of uh, Ravi Zacharias, maybe some of you are familiar with him, love him, sweetest accent I've ever heard, but he said recently that only out of a Judeo-Christian worldview could any government write this phrase, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Only those within a Judeo-Christian worldview can say that. Think about that. Muslims can't say that, nor will they. Buddhists can't say it. They won't. So has Satan been successful in devaluating or devaluing the human life? Seems like it. Now, the last statistic that I've heard is that the world is one-third Christian, I think that Christian term is grossly overused, and I would contend that that number is much less. But even if that were true, let's grant that the world is one-third Christian. That leaves two-thirds of the world that cannot say or will not say that all men are created equal, that they don't have these unalienable rights. They don't have inherent rights. So what's the fallout of this false ideology? You guys watch the news lately? Terror is one fallout. Meaningless executions, wars, nuclear weapons, abortion, euthanasia, eugenics, just to name a few. The value of the human life is being depleted by false ideologies, and, and the church, more than ever before, has to stand up and proclaim the right ideology. That we are all made in the image of God, imagio Dei. Did I say that right? Amagio Dei? Something like that. That every one of us were placed here purposely by the hand of God. Do you know what Satan wants? Do you know what he was really after in the Garden of Eden when he, when he went after Adam and Eve? You know what he was really after? He wanted to mar the Amagio Dei. He wanted to scar the image of God. See, the Bible says, so God created human beings in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. See, Satan knows he cannot touch God. And if he does, if he's blinded by his evilness, he's, he's just plain stupid. But you know who Satan can touch? You. And you know who it hurts the most when God's own image bearers are hurt. See, Satan is on a rampage to destroy human life by any means necessary. Satan doesn't like you. The pet sins that we keep around and we let hang out, they're not cute. They're not harmless like we think they are. They're meant to destroy you. You might be playing, but your enemy isn't. So let's look at this, this idol of Molech. See, Molech was this ancient god worshipped by the Amorites and the Phoenicians. Molech, the word, literally means to rule or to be king. That's what Molech means. So Israel, God's own people, they would periodically abandon the true god and they would end up worshipping this Molech. He's often called in history the, the deity of the underworld. See, idols of Molech, they were constructed by worshipers, and, and these idols were made out of, of hollow brass. Molech would have this human-like body and an ox's head, and he would have his hands outstretched normally as if to receive something. This picture probably isn't accurate. It's more like he's saying, it's good, right, or don't shoot at me. But the, 
The one next, uh, the, the picture next, that's probably more of an accurate Molech. See, when a person worshiped Molech, they would typically bring their firstborn to be sacrificed. Typically bring their firstborn. The Bible says that when we make sacrifices to idols, we are actually sacrificing them to who? Demons, right? So this is Satan's counterfeit kingdom in action, clear back here. So these apostate or confused, at least, Jewish mothers and fathers, they would present their child for sacrifice to this Molech just outside Jerusalem in a valley called the Valley of Hinnom at a place called Topeth or Tapheth. And I'll get to why that's important here in a second. But this baby would be placed into the hands of this Molech and then passed through the fire. Now, surrounding Molech, there were drums, and you can see it on, on these pictures, kind of the guys uh, sitting on their knees there. There were these drums. And when a baby was passed through the fire, these, these priests, air quotes again, would, would beat these drums and drown out the cries of the baby so the mother and father they couldn't hear their child dying. See, the place that this was done has been called uh, to either Tapheth or Topheth. Uh, the root Taph means to burn, and the root Toph means drum. So, you know, literally it's the place of burning or, or the place of the drum for obvious reasons. So this place in the Hinnom Valley became recognized as this place of punishment. When the Jews came back from their exile, from being in foreign lands, um, to show their repentance, to show their remorse, for ever turning their back on God and worshiping idols, just like this one, they made this Tapheth, they made this place the, the city dump of Jerusalem. And the place where bodies, carcasses of animals, and the bodies of criminals were thrown. This trash and these bodies, they would be constantly consumed by a fire that never went out. Never went out. The Jews started using this place to describe an everlasting fire and a place of destruction. Does that sound familiar? It became a symbol of hell, a place reserved for the wicked and for the non-believer. Uh, the writers of the gospel use the word Gehenna or, or Gehenna, and uh, they accredit Jesus with saying the following. He says, snakes, sons of vipers, how will you escape the judgment of Gehenna, hell? But I'll tell you whom to fear. Fear God, who has the power to kill you and then throw you into Gehenna, or Gehenna, I'm not sure, I'm not Greek, but yes, he's the one to fear. Now this Gehenna this word is made up of two root Hebrew words, uh, ga meaning steep valley and hinnom meaning lamentation. So this place was the place that our Lord himself likened to the fires of hell. Now, why is that important? Why does that matter? Why are we having a Greek and Hebrew lesson? Well, because many people want you to believe that Jesus only uses figurative language when he's talking about hell some say that there is no eternal suffering or any pain associated with the afterlife. But see, Jesus, in his very own words, I think it's pretty clear what he had intended by using the word Gehenna or Gehenna to describe hell. It's a, it's a place of conscious torment, physical, eternal pain. doesn't get much clearer. But now that really has nothing to do with today, does it? Um, why were people doing this? You wonder that? How could an honest worshiper of God be swayed by this Molech? How could they offer their firstborn? Well, there's a couple reasons. One was that some couples actually believed if they sacrificed their firstborn, they believed that Molech would ensure them financial prosperity. They believed that their lives for their future family would be secure, not that they deserved any more children. And two, the second reason that they would sacrifice these children is found in Micah 6, 7, and 8. Micah says, Shall we offer him, him is God, thousands of rams and 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Should we sacrifice our firstborn children to pay for our sins? He says, No, people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and walk humbly with God. See, Micah had obviously seen some of these Jews partaking in this practice and is answering the question that they must have had, how do we worship God and be cleansed of our sins? 
See, he's saying, don't sacrifice your kids, you idiots. Okay, I added the idiots, but, but Micah is saying, instead, God has already told you what is good. He wants you to do right, love mercy, walk with him humbly. See, some Jews believed if they sacrificed their children to this Moloch that God would somehow approve of this practice. For one, even the books of their law forbid this activity of sacrificing your children. And for two, for second, however you want to say that, uh, God commanded all sacrifices to, ha- to happen where? In the temple. Last I checked, is the temple down in the Valley of Hinnom at Topheth? No, that should have been their first clue. And aren't we the same way at times? Not that we worship in trash heaps or anything, but we think we can earn favor with God by our good deeds. Even the noble ones that we think are noble. Listen, your good deeds or or the bad ones that we think are so noble at times, they don't do anything to earn you favor with God. Your good deeds aren't the way you get to heaven. They're not the way you please God once you become a Christian. If you know Christ as Lord, your good deeds are only proof that you already belong in heaven. If your nature is changed, right? You've had true conversion. You're going to produce good deeds as a byproduct. It's who you are now. You want to please God? Do what's right. Love mercy. Walk humbly with God. Walking with God means that you are sharing your life with him. Walking with God implies, man, this thing, implies a relationship with God. You must have a relationship with God if you want to please him, amen? All right, so what does Molech really have to do with us today, this side of history? You say we don't sacrifice our children, Pastor Sean. We don't take part in this barbaric, pagan idol worship. We don't do that. But I say what we actually do is much worse, in my opinion, than anything that Israel ever did in their apostasy. Let me read you some statistics. From 2012, the average number of babies aborted in the U.S. in a single day was 3,750. A single day, church. I grew up in a town of 1,500 people. That's two of my towns plus a day put to death. An average of 22% of all pregnancies in the U.S., excluding miscarriages, end in abortion. That's almost one-fourth. We have the third highest abortion rate in the world. Only second and third to Red China, the former Soviet Union. By recent calculations, we have reached 1.37 million abortions per year, per year. Compare that to the nearly 4,500 soldiers that we've lost in Iraq to date. That's absolutely sickening. Can you imagine what the number would be without the underlying Christian influence in this country? Do you imagine if there's no voice against this practice? Scripture is very clear. Psalms 139. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. And that's not even the clearest indicator in Scripture. It's just one. But it still doesn't get much clearer than that when life starts. Listen, I know all cases aren't cut and dry. Some would say, what about when a mother's health is at risk? Or what if she's been a victim of rape? What do you do then? A survey was given to thousands of women who had an abortion in the U.S. alone back in 2004. And they were told to check all the answers that applied to them. And here's what the results were. Less than half a percentage of these women became pregnant and had an abortion due to incest. Less than 1% of them had abortions because they were victims of rape. 12% had abortions because of a potential health risk to them. So that's less than, by my math, 14% of all abortions due to those things. You want to know why these women had abortions? 74% 74 of these women had an abortion because 
the baby would, quote, dramatically change my life. No kidding. 73% said they can't afford a child right now. <laughs> Who can, man? 38% said it would interfere with their education. Another 38% said it would interfere with their career. 25% said they didn't want anyone to know that they had sex or had gotten pregnant in the first place. 22% 22% just simply said that I'm not mature enough to have a baby yet. Look, for the, the Christian, abortion is not a matter of a woman's right to choose. It's a matter of a life or death of a human being, being made in the image of God. Remember what Satan was attacking in the Garden of Eden? The Imago Dei, the, the image of God. What was Satan attacking as ancient cultures, including the Jews, sacrificed their children to Molech, literally a demon? The Imago Dei is the image of God under attack in our culture today. Are we fighting a battle against flesh and blood? So we know where this stems from. Is America now, is America still worshiping, effectively bowing to this Molech? Well, let's see. According to the statistics, we are overwhelmingly aborting babies because it would cause harm to our lives, namely our careers, our lifestyles. We're sacrificing babies for the same reason they were sacrificed back in ancient times. Financial security, prosperity. We're sacrificing human lives for pride. I don't want anyone to know that I got pregnant so they don't think different of me. I don't want anyone to know I had premarital sex. We are sacrificing them for self-gain. And the reason most abortions happen in the first place is because sex has become a normal thing outside of the confines of marriage. We're doing the very same thing these ancient worshipers of Baal, Asherah, Mammon, and Molech did. So what do we do, church? What do we do? We do what's right. We love mercy. We walk humbly with God, amen? Now let me speak to the women who have had an abortion. Statistically, one in every five women who have had an abortion self-identify as a a born-again Christian. And let me just say this, that you are not beyond forgiveness. You are not beyond forgiveness. The sin of abortion is no less forgivable than any other sin. Through faith in Christ, all sin can be forgiven. And this church, Lifehouse, needs to be a place where women just like this can come for healing. We need to be a church that receives those with a contrite and repentant heart and extends God's grace and love to them through our actions. God loves you, all right? He died for you while you were still sinners. And this church loves you too. And we want you to experience healing for your sin just as we've all experienced healing for the sins that we've committed. We're not going to judge you just because our sin looks different. So let me briefly touch on a couple more ways this spirit of Molech manifests itself in our culture today. I'll show you how we can overcome, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. Hi, Terry. Okay, hi. That's Terry, everybody. I like him. (laughs) Oh, he did? Ooh, I like that. That's a good idea. I, I wouldn't have even noticed. Thank you. That's good. Apparently, I'm getting a little hoarse up here, huh? (laughs) All right, so how else is the sanctity of life being targeted in our culture? How else do we see this spirit manifested? I've got many ways, but we only got time for a few. And I would invite each of you to look into every one of these and and see how they're affecting our country. But a few ways the human life is targeted in our country. Capital punishment, war, euthanasia, suicide, eugenics. Capital punishment, first one. Look, we can go around the room and we could effectively divide ourselves this morning for those for and those against capital punishment, the death penalty. The issue in Nebraska alone has proponents on both sides of the spectrum. We've seen that lately as the laws are being uh, challenged and rewritten, etc. Good people advocate for both sides. Now, in the institution of the church today, there is no clear cut for or against. Stance. Did you know that? Again, the, the whole institution of the church. 
Christians remain divided on the issue. Now, historically, we can, we can look to the early church fathers uh, who sources say would, or one source in particular says that they would think it unthinkable that a follower of Christ would take a life even as part of a judicial sentence. These are the founding you know, Christian fathers of the church. But then if you look all through history of Christendom or Christianity, history shows that the majority of the time, Christians, the leaders, have supported the death penalty. Martin Luther, founder of the Lutheran Church, one of the great reformers. I love Martin Luther. He was a huge proponent for the death penalty. He was for it. Now, look, I'm not trying to draw anybody into a debate this morning, but I want to draw you toward the responsibility that we have in the sanctity of life. So now it is true. You look at at verses like Genesis 9. It is true that uh, God will say, if anyone takes a life, a human life, that person's life will also be taken by human hands. For God made human beings in his own image. Notice here how the image of God comes up. See, by taking the life of another person who has done evil, God is guarding the Imagio Dei. But elsewhere in Scripture, we see Jesus offering grace to a woman caught, caught in, wow, that's weird, caught in adultery. <laughs> I'm back in seventh grade, my goodness. <laughs> Some of you got that. Some of you are like, what is he talking about? Anyway, but elsewhere in Scripture, we see Jesus offering grace to a woman caught in adultery, an act that required the death penalty by law. And Jesus said to her condemners, you who is without sin, cast the first stone. Now, by implication of this verse, it's plausible to think that this woman went on and and she did what Jesus said and, and sinned no more. She repented. And therefore, she lived a redeemed life. But the point is, is that we must weigh justice with grace when it comes to matters of capital punishment. And I will say this, the culture today, the way our culture, our judiciary system operates is nowhere near in line with the biblical teaching on the matter of capital punishment, mainly Old Testament law given by Moses. If we actually applied this law of Moses to capital punishment today, the number of executions that we see would would be drastically decreased. Moses' law calls for two eyewitnesses that were so sure of what they saw that they would stake their very own life on it. Most capital convictions today, they fall well short of that standard. So what about war? Is war justified? Should we ever go to war, etc.? Well, speaking to you, obviously, as an army veteran, so there's no, you know, question where I probably stand on the matter, having fought in a war myself, but look, it's not my topic to have a stance on, okay? It's God's opinion, and it's God's word that you should hold above mine, amen? My opinion should just simply agree with what God says. But scripturally, war has many purposes, and and we don't have time to get into most of them, but you can be sure of this. When God draws his own people into a war, uh, whether he's sending them, etc., or he's sending a rival nation into on his own people, his purposes are always for good. His purposes are always defending the Imagio Dei. Look, war is never desirable. And we should always look for alternate means to avoid conflict. But what kind of world would we live in today if we failed to defend ourselves against Adolf Hitler? Is the type of world where humans are executed simply because a race desirable? Now, by going on the offensive and stopping Hitler's advances, which included the overwhelming loss of life on this planet, evil was suppressed. And let me just point out that not all killing is evil. The commandment reads, thou shalt not murder. But not all killing equals murder. The same law that forbids murder permits killing in self-defense. Exodus 22.2. If a thief is caught in the act of breaking into a house and is struck and killed in the process, the person who killed the thief is not guilty of murder. Sometimes, such as the the instance of war, killing is necessary in our fallen world to quell evil and advance good. 
Obviously, we can take this idea way too far. We can come to the conclusion of the the Christian crusaders of the 11th century and kill anyone who refuses to come over to our side of the faith. But the point is not all killing is murder or evil. And in defense, you are defending the imago Dei of God and stopping evil in its tracks. So if you come to my house in the middle of the night and you're not a cat that came in through the cat door, maybe sometimes even a cat, I'm going to do what it takes to defend my family, amen? I'm not really sure what you're going to be looking for, being that I'm a youth pastor. (laughs) The most expensive thing I have in my house is probably the leftover carry-out Chinese food from yesterday. And speaking of cats and Chinese food, (laughs) you guys have heard the joke. I have a four-year-old that's absolutely convinced that the chicken on a stick is actually kitty on a stick. I don't know who gave her that idea. But (laughs) the funny thing is it doesn't stop her from eating it. She loves it. She loves it. It's especially funny when she's like picking at the stick and she's meowing to herself. She's like, meow. She loves it. She pets it. No, I don't know. (laughs) All right, moving on. Horrible Chinese food joke. The issue of euthanasia. And no, I don't mean the children in China. Nothing. Okay. My wife didn't get it either. Euthanasia, youth of, no, okay. (laughs) Wheels are falling off. Euthanasia is another assault against the sanctity of life in our country. Should we determine when our lives are to end? That's the question. Should we have a say in this matter? Is assisted suicide still suicide? And is death with with dignity still death? Three biblical principles to keep in mind. Death is an enemy. Life is a sacred gift from God. And when given the choice between life and death, God says, choose life. Scriptures, 1 Corinthians 15, 26. And the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death is your enemy. It's never a desire Genesis 2, 7, he breathed, God breathed the breath of life into the man's nostrils and the man became a living person. God gave you his very own breath. His breath sustains you. It's God's breath you're extinguishing when you're taking your own life. In Deuteronomy, or as I call it, the dude. Today I have given you the choice between life and death. Oh, that you would choose life. Moses was giving the nation of Israel, a bunch of curses or blessings that they could choose before going into the promised land. He says, you got the choice. Here's the answer. Choose life. Always choose life. Look, no one likes suffering, but often God's purposes are made through suffering, right? The Bible says this in Romans 5. It says that we too, nope, nope, I got it right here, that we can rejoice too, When we run into problems and trials, this Greek word for trials means oppression, affliction, stress. For we know that they help us develop endurance. And endurance develops strength of character. And character strengthens our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment. For we know how dearly God loves us. Because he has given us the Holy Spirit to to fill our hearts with his love. If you're suffering, rest assured that God is at work in your life. Trust God in suffering. Don't try to be God in the midst of it. All right, let's close this up. Application time, okay? How can we defeat this idol of Molech in our life? Remember now that that as we went through this American Idol series, that these spiritual principles are often or always different than the fleshly principles. We want financial security and prosperity in our flesh. Our flesh thinks, be greedy, get as much as you can. Take, 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 right? But God says, be generous, tithe, give of yourself, then you'll be rich. We want intimacy in our relationships. The flesh says, don't wait. Go get the desirable thing now. 
Don't wait until marriage. You can have it all now. But God says, wait for that one special person. Exclusivity equals intimacy. We want to preserve our own lives and the sanctity of life. Your flesh says, I got to sacrifice that person to get ahead. I got to look after me. I got to be prosperous. I got to push and shove to build my way up. Do what you have to do and live and live well. God says, if you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake, you'll save it. He also says this. Are we completely off here? Yeah, that's good. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Amen? Amen. To defeat the spirit of Molech in your life, give your life to God. If you've already done that, love God. Obey him. Are you loving and obeying God? Not God, but God. <laughs> There's a form of Christianity out there that says all you got to do is raise your hand. All you got to do is walk down an aisle. Accept Jesus as your Savior, and then once you leave here, do whatever you want to do. That's not conversion, guys. Conversion is the Spirit of God working inside your heart, changing you from the inside out, making you more like Christ every single day. If you truly love God, you will become, through a process, a new person. You'll become a new creation. If you truly love him, you'll obey his commandments. Jesus said to his disciples, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must turn from your selfish ways, take up your cross, and follow me. To deny yourself, you say, I no longer want to associate with that person that I am. I realize my sinfulness. I realize I cannot earn salvation. I abandon my self-effort. I abandon my self-confidence in the matter. But denying yourself, guys, denying yourself is more than that. You say, I abandon my self-will. I abandon my own agendas. I abandon my own ambitions and my own plans. I had plans to be a cop. That did not work out for me. But you know what? I'm much more fulfilled today doing this. When you come to Christ, you come to Christ, you are not only embracing the resources and the gifts that he provides, but you're bringing yourself under his sovereign lordship saying, you are Lord of my life. You are in charge. You're in charge of my life, my will, my desire, my plan, and my purposes. God, they're yours, not mine. I won't move, Lord, until you tell me what to do. To defeat Molech, surrender to God. Surrender to the one who made you in his image, Magio Dei. Amen. Would you guys stand? Lord God, we just thank you for your spirit. And Father, we do what we do on Sunday, not to hear fancy stories from a preacher, but to meet with you, to connect with you, Lord. And we come here corporately, we get a glimpse of what heaven will be someday. People from every tribe, tongue, nation, every ethnicity, Lord. They come together in song and they worship you, God. Our worship, when we sing, is simply our prayers, Lord, that we're offering up to you. Father, I pray amongst this body, God, that, that we don't do the culture of Christian thing, that we lay down our life and our will to you. And in that, we find life, Lord. The life that we want isn't the life that we, life we think we want isn't the life we need. We pray your will, your purpose, your desires come to fruition in our lives. And God, that starts today. That starts right now with a simple bowing of the knee and saying, Jesus, I am yours. I will read scripture. I will follow you, sometimes blindly. 
I will have the faith of a child in following you. Father, I pray you bless these people. I pray that they find their shape, their spiritual gifts, their abilities, their, their heart, their passions, their experiences. I pray they use them all for your kingdom and your glory. I pray for that one today that doesn't know you, Lord, that, that has heard this message and has said, man, I'd really like to have purpose in my life. I pray for them. I pray, God, that they abandon self-effort in trying to please you. God, I pray that they accept you right now by simple declaration that you are Lord of their life, that they accept the sacrifice that you paid on the cross for us. Father, I pray that they embrace that. I pray that they're truly converted and that your spirit do the rest of the work. God, we love you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you guys worship with us?